you've been searching for the best way to generate passive income in your life and heard that real estate is a great way to do it. But you're tired of all the so-called gurus who are all talk and no substance. Get ready to celebrate because Kevin Buck has spent 14 years successfully making it happen. This is the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Now, here's Kevin Buck. Alrighty, guys, it is my honor to introduce my guest for today's show, Director of Acquisitions and Senior Counsel of Time Equities, Inc., Max Pastor. Max, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Kevin. Thanks so much for having me on and uh, look forward to doing this. Yeah, very much so. I was looking forward to this show here for the last couple of weeks since we've had it scheduled and uh, very interested in, in, in learning a little bit more about your background uh, as well as the company, Time Equities. Time Equities has been around for you know over 50 years now. And so um, I know that we're going to go down a couple of different paths here today, but I guess before we get into the meat and potatoes, Max, what I love is just to uh, take a little bit more of a personalized approach in the beginning and, and um, you know, give you a few minutes to tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself, your background, you know, how you got into this industry and ultimately how your feet landed uh, with Time Equities. Sure. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. So uh, I got into real estate probably the old fashioned way. Uh, I was generally born into it in a sense, not with uh, great wealth or ownership, but my father and grandfather were real estate service providers. So if you see the painting behind me, it's of uh, the interstate highway bridges in Cincinnati, Ohio, which is where I'm from. And my grandfather was actually charged with procuring the real estate to build the interstate highway system in that part hmm. of the country. So he, he was charged with actually going through Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee and negotiating uh, to buy rights of way from landowners to create the highway system. So he taught me a lot of skills as a, as a young child and brought me with him on a lot of his uh, regional travels and, and really taught me how to negotiate and got me interested in real estate. And by the time I was uh, six or seven years old, easements, rights of way, uh, servitudes were things that were in my vocabulary. Um, so maybe I was somewhat of a, a, a real estate and legal savant from, from a young age. And that really is what um, got me interested in real estate initially, um, which, which sort of coincides with, with time equities. And I'll circle back to that, is that uh, time equities was founded by Francis Greenberger approximately 52 years ago. And, and Francis uh, also started the company at a very young age and actually bought his first building when I believe he was about 15 years old wow. um, and, and syndicated the deal. <laughs> and he goes into great detail about it. And that was the birth of, of Time Equities in his book, uh, Risk Game. So he was also somebody from a young age who had tremendous business acumen. And it's really been an honor to um, work with him th throughout my career. Um, how I started at Time Equities is uh, after um, graduating from undergrad, uh, I went to law school in New York City at a school, Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law. And actually within that building, it's an office condominium, uh, half of its owned by the law school and half by Francis and Time Equities. Mm -hmm. So as luck would have it, one summer day, uh, they had a posting for hiring an intern. And this was about 16 years ago. And I walked up my resume to, to Time Equities, turned it in, um, had an interview. And that was actually my, my first job was uh, a legal clerk for Time Equities and, and uh, working for Francis. So I've done a couple of things in between um, when I started there, and I actually left for a while and worked at a large international law firm and ran a private real estate company in New York. And about five years ago, Francis convinced me to, to come back to Time Equities and uh, co-lead a acquisitions and asset management team that uh, basically uh, invests all over the country. Uh, in value-add real estate opportunities. And uh, I'm sure we'll talk more about that 
as we get into it. Yeah, fantastic. So that's, that's my background. Yeah. There, there's a lot to unpack sure. there. In that, in that little condensed period of time, there's a lot to unpack there. And so what we do know about you, Max, is that probably during like your eighth grade book reports, you were giving, um, you were giving uh, uh, reports on surveys and easements and different real estate jargon and uh, probably confusing the heck out of not only the uh, students, but also the teachers uh, in class. <laughs> <laughs> That, that's fantastic, and I, I'm, I'm going to make a note, guys, of the uh, the book. Uh, in fact, Max, if you would please repeat the name of the book that Francis that, that he had written as well, because that, that sounds very intriguing. I'd love to learn a little bit more about his history and his story of, uh, especially syndicating a deal when he was 15 years old. That's quite impressive. Sure, the book is called Risk Game, and it's by Francis J. Greenberger. I mm-hmm. think it was published in uh, 2017 or 2018. It's okay. a it's a quick read and and full of lots of good advice and. Uh, some great real estate stories. Okay, fantastic. So I'd love to chat about the the company itself. I mean, we know 52 years ago, Francis uh, did his first deal. He was 15 years old. Just from a from a generalized perspective, um, what was the, the core focus of the company 52 years ago? And ultimately, how has that changed over the years uh, from that very first deal? Sure. Well, the first um, office deal that Francis really got involved with was he, he was running his uh, father's publishing um, agency. And they had too much office space and he sublet some office space. This was also about 52 years ago. And in doing so, he realized he was making, you know, more money off the subleasing of the space than perhaps the business was producing. And thus was born the idea of getting into real estate. And, And that's where sort of led into syndicating and buying his first building and ultimately building a company. And I think a company like Time Equities isn't built um, overnight, but it's really sticking true to your core investing values. So Mm -hmm. when we look at what we're buying and how we're operating, we generally, and I always think of of, of three things, which I ultimately call the Time Equities trifecta, is can we buy things at a low purchase price? at a above market cap rate and with room to grow either occupancy wise or in our rental rate wise because those three things taken together will put us into a a good position and really francis has employed that strategy and as far as being in multiple product types in diverse regions throughout his career and, and it's really what has given the company uh, both Francis and Time Equities, the ability over time to have a very high batting average um, and really look at things in an innovative way. Because what we're focused on is really growing cash flow as opposed to investing simply for short-term holds mm-hmm. and capital appreciation. It's more of a long-term perspective. Got it. Got it. No, that's quite interesting. And I'd love to speak to the the, the diversity of the company from an asset-based perspective. I mean, I, I found some statistics on the website, and I don't know if these have changed, but uh, right now it, it states that your portfolio is uh, approximately made up of uh, 31 million square feet of residential, industrial, office, and retail property, and more than 4,000 multifamily apartment units. Uh, in addition to that, you guys are in uh, various stages of development and pre-development of more than 1.4 million square feet of various property types, um, which includes more than you know 1,400 residential units. In addition to that, you're in 30 different states, five Canadian provinces, Germany, the Netherlands, Antigua, and the list goes on and on. And so I'd love to, to get a general sense um, you know, of exactly what that means for you, your role in the company, your director of acquisition. So just speaking to the different statistics there of, of, of all the different aspects of real estate you guys are involved in, um, how does your role play into all that? Sure. Well, let me first start by, by maybe taking you through a little bit of the uh, macro structure of the yeah. company and then coming back to uh, my role within that. So we are a full service real estate investment company and we have our own acquisitions and asset management department, our own legal department and our own equity department that services all the needs of time equities. Uh, the equity that we invest comes both from our internal sources as well as we have a, a broker dealer fund that co-invests alongside of us. Mm-hmm. So I'm one of the directors of acquisitions. We generally have three to four teams that 
uh, go around and source acquisition opportunities and, and asset management opportunities for us. Some of the teams have uh, expertise in retail or international investing. Others have expertise on a nationwide portfolio. For instance, uh, where I concentrate my efforts on is leading a team that invests in office, industrial, multifamily, and mixed use Mm -hmm. uh, value-add opportunities throughout the United States. Um, And some other groups, like I said, specialize in retail or the Netherlands and and Germany. And we also have a development arm. Some of the notable projects the development arm have recently produced is 50 West Street in Lower Manhattan. And they're currently uh, building a high rise on uh, South Michigan Avenue called 1000 South Michigan in uh, Chicago. Hmm. Very interesting. So I'd love to, you know, from a perspective of the, of the trifecta um, uh, target that you guys go for with, with all the different acquisitions, um, I'd love to get a sense from you as to how times have changed and, you know, bringing us to today's period of time, a very competitive landscape. Everyone's out there chasing yield. What major differences have you noticed from, let's say, let's just back up, you know, two or three years to um, today as we, as we record this show and how are you guys um, still staying incredibly active in a, you know, much more competitive landscape as far as buyers are concerned? Sure. Well, we're certainly out there looking at all the deals and, and scouring uh, the country and, and the planet for opportunities. But there's no doubt that with uh, interest rates being as low as they are and capital flowing as freely as it does, the competition level uh, is intense for assets. So generally, we have taken a defensive strategy, even though we, we've been very active and we've stayed true to, to our core. So those assets have been harder to come by but by staying persistent and leveraging relationships, whether it be with banks uh, or other developers, um, you can find deals that work for you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm a big believer, and, and, and Francis, I think, has taught me over the years that really uh, the money is made on your buy. Yes. So you need to stay true to, to yourself. And, and um, as we go through different cycles, um, if your basis in the property is low, you will be protected ultimately. Mm-hmm. Okay. If, if rents fall, you can still have a positive return. Mm-hmm. So what we've done is a lot of the capital that's come in has really looked at core markets. And we've found that those markets have really been bid up to a level where um, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense from a leverage perspective to invest there if you're investing long term. So we, we've really been most successful, at least speaking for my team, uh, when we've gone into secondary uh, or even sometimes tertiary markets <laughs> and, and been able to execute, buy well, and uh, execute our business. Mm-hmm. And I can give you a couple of examples um, if you'd like. Or yeah, that'd be fantastic. That'd be fantastic. Sure. So uh, about two years ago, um, we went down to Roanoke, Virginia, which is, mm-hmm. has a, a nice but uh, small CBD. And we bought uh, from basically a, a property that had been taken over by its lender. It was 160,000 square foot CBD, B plus, A minus office building that we bought for about $60 a foot. Uh, it was 52% occupied. And we bought it for about a 10 cap going in on the purchase Hmm. price. Um, Now your return after reserving for tenant improvements or leasing commissions is lower than that, but it gave us a great cushion going in. Mm -hmm. Uh, We had a very solid lease up plan and improvement plan to the building. And we we felt good about the, the market and sort of the local team we had assembled there. And within 18 months, we were able to get the building up to about 95% occupancy and execute uh, a a financing of the property because we had purchased it all cash and and returned uh, essentially about 70% of the capital back to our investors, Mm -hmm. uh, plus had a very high um, leveraged return on the remaining cash in the deal. So that's really the type of transactions um, 
from a value add perspective that, that we look to do, but you know, you don't find them every day and you have to dig a little bit deeper, uh, both in markets uh, and an effort to, to find those and source those opportunities. I'd love to get a better understanding like on that particular deal. I always like to dissect, you know, what, what went wrong, you know, with the last owner, that private, right? That, that's part of your due diligence process when you're looking at an asset, you know, what ultimately went wrong and can we do it better? What exactly was that from the, uh, you know, before it got taken back by the lender? What do you think went astray on that deal at some point, you know, in the last, you know, whatever, five, 10 years, what was it? And then ultimately, how did you gain the confidence that, um, that, that your team would be able to execute concisely on that plan? And again, going from 52% to 95% in a matter of 18 months uh, on, what is that? That's essentially you guys are leasing up somewhere, what, 70,000? I can't do quick math like that, but 70,000 know, square feet of space fairly quickly and uh, you know, basically a year and a half. That's a lot. You know, go, going back to uh, w- when I was talking about low basis mm-hmm. and uh, not to harp on this point, but what happens in, in a lot of these situations, and we're actually um, doing a deal like this now, very similar uh, to the one I described to you, we're, we're going to be closing in two weeks, is that we buy it from somebody who had a much higher basis in the property Mm -hmm. and they, and they purchased it at a very high dollars per square foot and it was over leveraged. And and what that does to the property is that if rents have gone down, uh, you can't really uh, agree on those rents and bring people into your building because even if you do, you can't pay your debt service sometimes. Mm -hmm. And also what coincides with that is often uh, the ownership group, once the property gets distressed, because maybe a a large tenant left, that there's not capital to put in for tenant improvements and leasing commissions uh, to attract tenants. So Mm -hmm. what happens? The property basically sits there with vacancy and you can't really execute deals where the Mm -hmm. market is and there's not capital available to entice tenants to come to your building. So, you know, it's one of those situations where sometimes the third investor in is, is the one who makes <laughs> the money in the deal, un- un- unfortunately. The second investor is the bank. The first one was uh, the developer. So by coming in at a low basis, we have flexibility generally on where we can rent properties relative to the market and our competition. And we also make sure that within our capital stack, we have enough funds available for tenant improvements and leasing commissions and incentives to make our building the most attractive mm-hmm. in the market if somebody's looking for space. And we don't have to get too granular here, but was that essentially that office property? Was that a you know, a, a securitized loan that went into a term default based on the the occupancy? Something that was maybe purchased back in like '06 at the height of the the last cycle. Um, you're you're precisely right, okay. and and that's. Uh, so it was a securitized lender and it was somebody who had a high basis. Um, and, and that's what happens. You know, the good news is with the securitized lenders that you, you get very good terms, but also just by nature of the product, when you get into a sticky situation like that, it's not easy to, you don't have a lending relationship with your uh, ultimate note holder. So it's hard to say, hey, we need another X number of dollars to make improvements to the building. That mm-hmm. product doesn't allow for that. Yeah. I know that there was, a, you know, in the past couple of years, there's been a lot, of, um, a lot of dialogue revolving around the, you know, a lot of those CMBS loans that were, that were created back in, you know, let's say 04, 05, 06, that were ultimately coming on their 10-year term and, and that there was going to be this massive implosion of, uh, of securitized debt. And I don't know if it's really, maybe you guys see something that we don't, you, you dabble in that space a lot more than we do, but what have you seen? I mean, is, is, is there opportunity, is, is there an abundance of opportunity there today or did it not really play out um, as much as what we thought it was going to as far as the, uh, the amount of defaults? You know, I think there were selective opportunities and, and beyond yeah. the building I was talking to you about, we did have several other buying opportunities and transactions okay. that we closed. <clears throat> However, uh, I, I too, I like, agree with you. Uh, I never saw the onslaught of <laughs> so much available product that was um, originated in that 05, 06, 07 mm-hmm. uh, timeframe. And maybe that's because 
things got very bad. And then ultimately they started to improve uh, and people were able to, to work them out. Uh, we're not the most active uh, note buyer. We, we do do it occasionally, um, but we generally buy um, fee product or fee simple title to, uh, to assets. Okay. I'd love to get a sense from you since the company 52 years, you guys have been through multiple recessionary periods of time. And obviously you haven't been with the company for all 52 years, but I'm sure that you've been there long enough that you know historically um, how things have changed or ebbed and flowed within the company. Is there certain strategies that you guys take into consideration other than just buying at a low basis on all new acquisitions or all current acquisitions that, that, that are in the pipe? Are there additional strategies that you guys put more of an emphasis on? For example, your, your fee uh, side of the company, your fee-based services that you offer, as you go into these different peak cycles, is it something to where you guys make a slight shift over to putting, you know, growing that side of the business that typically, you know, uh, uh, um, you know finds a growth period uh, during times of distress or uh, do you just keep moving forward status quo? Well, it, that's an interesting question and, and there's a couple of different answers for it. Uh, the fee part of the business really services uh, our platform and not, isn't necessarily uh, designed as a income generator that would carry the company okay. through uh, a recessionary period. So what would carry us through that period is we continue to be uh, defensive and conservative in our analysis and underwriting. And we yeah. talked about low basis, so I, I won't go back to, to that. But there's another concept that uh, Francis taught me very early on and has really served me well throughout real estate investing. And, and that's the concept uh, of positive versus negative leverage. And if I could take you know, a quick 10 seconds to explain what I mean is if you can borrow money right now, let's say on multifamily, let's pick a number, say 4%. Mm -hmm. If I was to buy a four and a half percent cap rate in New York. Uh, ultimately, after I, I pay my expenses and, and things like that, I, at best case, my leverage is going to be flat or I'm actually going to be with uh, amortization paying more in leverage mm -hmm. costs than I'm earning on the property. And that's a bad situation to be in when uh, cycles turn. Whereas if we go out of market, and we buy something with an 8% return, and we're paying 6% in uh, loan costs all in, we have positive leverage. And, and that means that things can get worse before we have any risk of not being able to service our debt. So mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a, it's a key fundamental, especially as, as we think we're late in the cycle, um, it, it's not a time, not that there ever is a time, but you need to be very sensitive to um, having a negative leverage scenario. Do you guys typically have a, a rule of thumb for, you know, amount of spread between, you know, current debt that might be available for that, you know, particular asset given its current situation and also what the actual going in cap rate is? Do you have a rule of thumb that you go with or is it a case by case basis? Sure. It, it's somewhat of a case by case basis, but, but there's a sort of fundamental rule that we try to follow. Mm -hmm. and, and that is the cap rate can be a little bit deceiving. Um, mm -hmm. It's sure. good as a, a broker's number or a talking point for relative valuation. But really what we like to look at is what is our unleveraged return based on our project costs? Mm -hmm. So the cap rates based on the purchase price, but if we're doing a value add scenario or we have some capital work to do going in, we like to take our total cost and then look at what our return is after applying a reasonable reserve for capital items and vacancy and items like that. So what we really try to shoot for going in is a 7% unleveraged return on our capital stack. And seven is a good number to us because we feel like it's a good baseline going in but also mm -hmm. it gives us room to positively um, leverage the property from early on. Mm -hmm. And beyond this, the initial seven, we look to have growth, but yeah. that's where we like to start. Okay, fantastic. Well, Max, I'd love to shift gears if we could, and uh, there are a few other uh, things I'd like to hit on here before we uh, you know, work towards wrapping up the show. And one of the big ones would be, 
um, you know, being that you're, you're a, you're an active cog, a very key cog in a fairly large organization. I'm not exactly sure, you know, the size of, uh, of, of the staff there at time equities, but, um, you know, it's all relative. And, and really this question is, is based around you being the director of acquisitions. Um, obviously you've got, a, I'm, I'm assuming a number of folks that, that report to you. So you're overseeing a, a strategic team in that sense. What are some of the you know, specific time management strategies that you feel have had a large impact in your life and overall success that you implement on a, on, implement on a regular basis? Sure. I, I think uh, one of the key things I try to do every day is compartmentalize. Mm -hmm. And I've recently started this in the last several years. And, the, and it's really blocking out time to do specific tasks during the day while still allowing some elasticity to, to manage things that come up that are, are unplanned. But um, early on in my career, I, I remember getting two and 300 emails a day and responding to everything or trying to in real time. And, and you know, one of the, the simplest uh, time management techniques uh, that I've started utilizing is uh, scheduling time to respond to emails and correspondence, just like I would meetings and, and not doing it in real time because it mm -hmm. can be, it can really sidetrack you. So I, I think being present, doing in your task, blocking off time for specific things and really focusing on those items during that time and not getting distracted is how I've yeah, that, that's fantastic. Thing. Email is my arch nemesis. It really is. Um, I, I still haven't figured out how to absolutely master that. I, I, I do. Um, I do share in the concept of uh, compartmentalizing the email and uh, you know just really focusing on a set period of time. And uh, like all of us, we fall out of habits. And uh, I, I tend to find myself, you know, a few days into a week, and I'm like, what am I doing here? I'm already. I'm, I, just, I just spent two hours, you know, buried in the trenches of email, and uh, right. I promised myself that that would not happen. And uh, now that I get pulled away from things that are much more important, things that are actually helping progress the company forward, whereas a lot of these emails, you're just being reactive. You're in a reactive state nonstop, and that's not healthy. That's not. That's not really a growth aspect of the business. Not the best place to be spending your time for the most part. And so Absolutely. I'm glad to hear that I'm not the only one that has that channel. <laughs> the other thing I do is usually the hardest or most important task. Do it first. Yes. Yes. In, in your day, and uh, try to schedule it easier as it, as it goes on or leave your less important tasks to the That's end. an interesting strategy. And that's one, it's, it's fairly common. You hear about it quite often, but it's, it's, it's a uh, very hard to maintain in practice. And the reason being is that, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, once we start checking things off of whatever that proverbial to-do list is, right? However you have it formatted, um, it makes you feel good. It makes you feel accomplished. However, that big item could be something that you might not even get really completed in that one day. And, you know, so I find a lot of folks fall, fall into that habit of at least maybe putting one or two easy things in front of that big item so they can feel that no matter what, they got something accomplished in that given day. And I think that's the, um, that is the, uh, the death trench that some fall into when trying to <laughs> utilize that strategy. But no, I feel you. Um, it, that's it's true. With that big beast, right? The 800 pound gorilla uh, at the beginning of the day. And ideally what I have found, I've got two young boys. And so it's a little more challenging in my household to, um, to find that quiet time in the morning before I come into the office. Uh, it's incredibly challenging. Uh, however, I do find that if I can get up and have an hour of focus uh, before the house wakes up, right? Before, before things start going crazy and food starts flying around the, the kitchen and things of that nature, uh, that I, I start chunking away at that 800 pound gorilla, whatever it might be, or maybe it's not even actually making progress on it. However, really planning for it or the night before planning how I'm going to attack that, that beast of a task, uh, you know, again, just trying to knock out the biggest one. That's the most important. That's really going to push the company or your department forward, right? That, that's the most important part of, of each and every daily activity that we have that's work related is, is growing the company, pushing it forward, gaining momentum. So I love to, um, Max, I love to enter in what we call the, the lightning round. And these are basically a, a collection of six different questions. Uh, very, very straightforward questions that we're seeking very straightforward, simple answers on. And so if you're ready for it, man, I'd love to roll into it. Let's roll. All Let's right. Do it. First and foremost, your biggest fear. What is it? My biggest fear, I went to the Ohio State University. It's losing to the University of Michigan <laughs> in football. I love it. I love it. I love it. One biggest regret. Uh, biggest regret that I didn't do some criminal defense attorney work uh, immediately out of law school. It was always an interest and uh, I, I didn't get the opportunity to do it. 
Okay. Most influential business book. I would have to say Risk Game by, by Francis All Greenberger. Right. But, but recently I also read a book uh, by Erez Cohen called uh, Real Estate Titans. And uh, I was able to gr uh, glean some good lessons from uh, various successful people in the industry by reading it. And who was the author of that one again? Erez Cohen. Eris Cohen. Guys, I'll put that in the show notes for you as well. All right. Outside of the daily work grind, what do you do to decompress? Uh, I love to play tennis, which is a, a great opportunity to decompress, uh, hang out with friends and family. I have a, a daughter and a son, so I'm pretty much a family guy. But uh, when I can, I like to get out on the court and hit it around a bit. Okay. The one thing you can't live without? The one thing I can't live without. Unfortunately, I'd have to say it's my iPhone. But uh, I hope, hope your wife's not listening to this. You should see your <laughs> wife, right? <laughs> no, of course. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, I'll make sure she doesn't get it. No, in any event, uh, last one here in the lightning round. What would your plan B be if one day that you decided no longer you wanted to do what you're doing here today? I think I know the answer, but go for it. Sure. Uh, well, criminal defense attorney, I talked about. But yeah. uh, other than that, I, I would love to own a and run sort of a, a yoga and tennis studio Interesting. Uh, in, in retirement. I think that would be a sort of great mix of, uh, of activities that uh, would be enjoyable. Talk to me about the blend of those two. I, I'm assuming that you're, you're obviously active in tennis. You're also probably active in yoga, being that you'd love to open up a studio. I aspire to be, yeah. but, I, but I'm not as much as I, as I, uh, as I would like to. But, but I think uh, the stretching and the flexibility – uh, it benefits you in tennis and, and basically in overall health. And it's two things. If I had infinite amounts of time, I, I would love to do both hmm. of those more. Very interesting. Have you don't, I, I don't know how long you've been practicing yoga, but have you noticed any type of uh, added benefit to just your, uh, your, your daily work life per se, as far as your mental clarity, energy, what have you? Yeah. You know, recently it, it's not, definitely tied to yoga, but I started do, utilizing an app called Headspace, which I know a lot okay. of people uh, utilize from time to time. And I found that just taking uh, five to seven minutes a day to do one of their meditations or focuses has actually helped sort of in uh, compartmentalizing and sharpening uh, sort of my acumen, both business and personal um, throughout the day. And it's uh, I, I've been quite surprised at how much uh, a little bit of time can actually improve your overall performance. It was okay. uh, quite mind opening. Yeah. That's so headspace is the app. Okay. Yep. Fantastic. Well, Max, you shared lots of, uh, lots of great golden nuggets here today. It's been an absolute pleasure having you. And what I'd like to ask of you is if you had just one final gold nugget of advice or wisdom um, still laying around somewhere on your desk there uh, that you could leave with our listeners today that may inspire and motivate them as they progress in their own real estate investing career, what would that one last golden nugget be? Sure. The, the golden nugget would be, and we talked about it, is you make money on the buy and have a low basis. And yes. uh, Combine that with the opportunity for, for positive leverage, and I think you've greatly enhanced uh, your, your, um, your ability to have or likelihood to have a successful investment. Yeah, fantastic. I, I love every bit of it. Folks, if you'd love to learn more about um, you know, what Max and his team have going on, you can go visit their website, which is timeequities.com. Again, that's timeequities.com. Max, is there anything else that you'd like to leave with us here today before we get on? I think we covered a lot of ground. I think we discussed a lot of great things, lots of, uh, lots of golden nuggets. They're not just that last one, just tons of great things that you share with our, our community here today. Is there anything else that you feel might be relevant about yourself, about time equities, uh, or anything in general that, uh, that you'd like to share before we roll out? Well, certainly if anybody's interested in getting to know time equities better, or our investment strategy, they can feel free to reach out to me directly or go to our website. Uh, I really thank you for having the opportunity to come on your show today. It, it was great. And uh, hopefully I provided people with uh, a little bit of advice that they can use and help better themselves. So yeah. thanks a lot for the opportunity, Kevin. Fantastic. Thank you, Max, for coming. Really appreciate it. And thank each and every one of you for tuning into today's show. And until we meet again next week, this is your host, Kevin Bupp, wishing you huge success.